Hello there, welcome everyone. How about another hand for Eduardo Costa? My name is John Paul Jones. I'm the Don Bennett, mean, uh, Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and welcome back uh, for our second in the four-week installment of Animalities. Tonight's speaker loves dogs but studies bison, <laughs> and my uh, bolo tie and boots are homage, not irony. Uh, before I introduce her, I want to say special thanks to our title sponsors, Haloa Lua Companies, Mike and Beth Kasser, and our SBS advisory board members, Ken and Linda Robin. Thank you very much for supporting this. Also, our great crew as supporting sponsors behind the curtain here and live streaming all over the world, uh, AZPM, and then about 24 to 36 hours after tonight's event, anyone can go back and, uh, and watch tonight's lecture. Uh, thank you, AZPM. <laughs> and our community sponsors, Drs. Vivi and Adib Sabah, uh, Dr. Uh, Barbara Starrett and Joanne Ellison, um, Penka Restaurante, and um, I wanna thank especially Patricia Schwalbe, who couldn't be with us here tonight, but encourages all of you, or maybe uh, this side, to go to her restaurant tonight uh, on Broadway after the uh, lecture and have a drink and uh, enjoy some dinner. Also, uh, Park Tucson for um, all their help in getting everybody in on a very busy uh, Thursday night with uh, roads closed from uh, Tucson Meet Yourself, which starts tomorrow night, and I encourage all of you to go to. And then finally, uh, this wonderful historic Fox Tucson Theater. Thanks to everyone who put all this together and made it happen. <laughs> Dr. Maria Nieves Cedeno uh, is our speaker tonight. She received her uh, PhD from Southern Methodist University and joined the University of Arizona in 1994. She is a research professor in and director of the Bureau of Applied Research in Anthropology in the School of Anthropology, where she also holds the title of professor. And as an anthropologist, her work involves archaeology, ethnohistory, and ethnography to reconstruct past cultural landscapes and to better understand contemporary cultural practices on landscapes, particularly those in the uh, Northern Plains, Montana, North Dakota, but also Alberta, uh, where she has decades worth of work uh, with a Blackfeet tribe uh, in that part of um, uh, North America. She looks at a lot of different variables, including um, what we would call culture, or ways of making meaning of the world, uh, but also ways of life, demography, migration, ethnicity, territories, uh, all of which takes place on the land, involves the relationship obviously between people and the land, but also natural resources, and finally, and not least, animals. And that's why uh, she's here tonight, because of her extensive work with the Blackfeet uh, and the bison. She is the author of uh, many publications, books, research monographs, um, research reports, and uh, articles and book chapters. She's received some $2 million worth of uh, grants to support her work and the work of her colleagues, uh, her tribal collaborators, and her students, all of which I am very pleased to say uh, are working in uh, this field uh, with indigenous peoples in archaeology and in demography, both internationally and nationally. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Nieves Zedeno. Nieves? Thank you. 
Good evening. And uh, thank you for coming to listen to my talk. Uh, today, I would like to tell you about one of the oldest of human-animal interactions in North America, that of hunters and bison. And I will focus specifically on bison hunting specialists, those who have inhabited the northwestern plains of North America, Canada, and the United States since time immemorial, or perhaps archaeologically since at least the end of the last glaciation. You will hear me say throughout the talk, black food and black feet. Those terms are not interchangeable, neither are plural or singular. Black food refers to the confederacy with whom I work, to the territory, to the ethnicity, the culture, and the language. Blackfeet, on the other hand, is the legal name of the Blackfeet tribe and its reservation in Montana. And I'm going to do my best to keep those two straight so that, you, so that I don't confuse you. Well, just to set the mood, let me begin with a story, a Blackfoot story. In the beginning, the creator, Old Man Nappy, came from the sky to make the world. Traveling from south to north, he made the Rocky Mountains and the prairie. He made rivers and lakes and springs. From his own blood, he made red ochre, red paint. And then he made animals and plants and birds and fish. He put bison on the grassland, on the prairie, and bighorn sheep on the mountains. And then he made people, he made humans. But the humans he made had no arms or hands. hands. So a short time later, his humans came to him and pleaded, Old Man Nappy, take pity on us. We can't feed ourselves. We are starving. We are being killed and devoured by monsters, by these large furry animals. We can't defend ourselves. So the creator, realizing his mistake, he came back onto the earth and gave them not only arms and hands, but he gave them weapons. He taught them how to make weapons and how to hunt. And ever since, there has been this profound and unbreakable bond between humans, hunters, and bison. Now, about 200,000 years ago, give or take a month, um, the first bison came from the old world to top populate North America, just about the time before the third of four glaciations. Now, the bison that came were not modern bison, the bison that you see today. They were uh, extinct species of bison. There have been four species of bison that evolved in the North American continent two of which, bison anticus and bison bison, which is the modern bison, were actually uh, hunted by the Paleo-American people. Bison anticus became extinct about 10,000 years ago, but modern bison went on to evolve and to populate unbelievably successfully every possible niche where he could find grass or anything edible. And that is why bison was so successful, the only large herbivore that was successful at the time, at the end of the, of the Ice Age. Because he was a generalist. He, of course, he ate grass because that was his favorite food. But on a pinch, he could snack on some willow shoots, some mesquite pods, the understory vegetation of, you know, the Sejus Forest in the Ohio Valley. So he is spread across the continent from the boreal forest in the north to the Sonoran Desert, and from the Rocky Mountains to the Ohio Valley. So just to give you a sense of how many bison were there at the time of arrival of the first Europeans into the continent, there were an estimated 30 to 60 million bison. Explorers ex explain and describe that bison blackened the prairie as far as the eye could see for days or weeks on end. Within 300 years, bison had decreased 
by 75%. And in the last 50 years of the 19th century, bison came to the brink of extinction. In 1883, there were only 574 bison, both in Canada and in North America. What happened? Aside from the immense engine of settlement of the West, um, there were several very specific factors that influenced the near extinction of bison. In the, in the 1820s, a uh, New York entrepreneur named uh, John Jacob Astor um, <clears throat> realized very shortly that the fur trade in uh, beaver pelts was no longer viable in Europe and, uh, and it was being, in fact, replaced by Chinese silk. But he didn't want to abandon the trade because he had already set up this huge like, transcontinental trade apparatus. So he turned his sights toward bison hides because the burgeoning Industrial Revolution was demanding a great deal of leather for their machinery. So he set trading posts along the Missouri River, the upper Missouri River Valley, from the city of St. Louis all the way to the, to the Rocky Mountains. And he attracted Native American hunters who had already been trading with Europeans and Euro-Americans to hunt bison for the industrial trade. On a given year, as many as 180,000 bison hides were floated along the Missouri River down to St. Louis and beyond. Now, when that trade began to dwindle, just about the same time, uh, the railroad, the transcontinental railway, began its construction. And as you can imagine, huge herds of bison were a huge nuisance to the railroad workers, because not only did they stop them from progressing, but they also destroyed, they completely trampled the newly laid rails. So it was such a problem that they, the, the railroad invited travelers, guests, and their passengers were uh, encouraged to shoot, wantonly shoot bison on sight along the way. And then, of course, there were larger, older, and more profound reasons for why bison almost disappeared. Thomas Jefferson Agrarian Dream and his descendants wanted so badly to see American families take on farming, have their own farms, till the ground, be productive, make the soil produce. But as they were moving to the West, they realized that no Native American in the West was willing, or at least not in the Northwest, was willing and able to settle down and have a farm especially bison hunting, hunting specialists, the Blackfoot and their neighbors. Why should they farm? They were wealthy, self-sufficient, powerful, and they have the freedom, they wanted to do anything, but yet the government perceived of them as wasteful, using up land that they had not used for, lazy, unruly, bloody rebels, and ultimately very, very dangerous to Jefferson's agrarian dream and to the settlement of the West. For example, in 1873, Columbus Delano, Secretary of Interior under President Grant wrote, I would not seriously regret the total disappearance of the buffalo from our Western prairies in the effect upon the Indians. I would regard it rather as a means of hastening the sense of dependence on the products of the soil and their la own labors. And by this he meant that if you removed the very source of their independence and their self-sufficiency, bison, you would subdue them and make them farmers. How wrong he was. And hence came, befell upon us, upon our continent, the worst ecological disaster of very many, many centuries. But this ecological disaster was not just natural. It affected about a third of indigenous people that occupied, that populated both the, the continent about from Canada, from the boreal forest, 
all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, not everybody was affected equally. On the south, there were farmers who hunted bison in summer while they were waiting for their crops to ripen. In the center, there were hunters who farmed. Then as you go further north, there were generalists, hunters who also trapped and fished and consumed a wide variety of wild products. And then to the far north, there were the Blackfoot for whom bison was the only real food, and even though in times of duress, they would consume other game. That food was nothing food. As you can imagine, they lost a lot. They not only lost their wealth, their food, the walls of their lodges, their winter coats, raw materials for their tools, the very thread that they used to sew their clothes, They lost their center, their identity as hunters, the core of their world, because hunting is not just a subsistence activity. Hunting is a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of seeing the world, a way of, to, a way of imagining those things that cannot be seen. So, for a, about a hundred years, archaeologists and with no small help from historians and ethnographers of the early 20th century, have been attempting and putting a great amount of effort and work and funding have been into the reconstruction of this ancient way of life, the ancient bison hunting way of life. And of course, uh, the archaeology of bison hunting is an archaeology of bone and stone. And here you see um, the father of bison hunting archaeology, Dr. George Friesen, from the University of Wyoming, excavated in the Horner site early in the 1940s. From him and his students and many other scholars, we have been able to uh, portray a very stark uh, view and reconstruction of how pre-contact bison hunters worked and lived. And to that, we have been, added, we have been able to add meat to those bones and to those stones, but looking at how, how incredibly rich, complex, and colorful life was before the arrival of the American government and the Industrial Revolution into the Western Plains. So we know a great deal about bison and bison hunting, and we also don't know an immense deal. We know, for example, that for the better part of 14,000 years, small groups of hunters um, pursued single animals or very small numbers of prey. They didn't need to really kill that many animals. They couldn't, they couldn't manage that large a herd or a, or a, for hunting, and they also were really well adapted to a landscape that they could handle in a small numbers. Now, about 4,000 years ago, the very first communal hunting site appears in the archaeological record is in the Crow Reservation in southern Montana. This was the first massive bison kill known in the region. And yet it is very rare. It is perhaps the only so large bison kill for that time period. So rarely you saw sites that represented mass kill until about 2,000 years ago. And as I will tell you very soon, about 2,000 years ago, there were a series of incredibly critical innovations for hunters that stimulated not only population growth, but also technological growth and very sophisticated ways of permanently changing the landscape, modifying the landscape, not only to hunt for the day or the month or the year, but to actually plan for a future into the future generations. So, I was working about 2007. I had been working in the Blackfeet Indian Reservation on one unrelated project, uh, but nonetheless incredibly important to the Blackfeet tribe, the Badger to Medicine Traditional Cultural District nomination, when uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Blackfoot, historic, Blackfoot Historic Preservation Officer John Murray, who is also a religious leader and a philosopher uh, by training, gave me a VIP tour 
along with some elders, of their old bison hunting sites. And they explained to me how they worked. I didn't know exactly what I was looking at. They explained to me how they were built, how they were used, what was the consequence of the uses of those sites. And then they said to me, you know Maria, that's my first name, you know Maria, um, we would really like you to study these sites. We want you to study them scientifically so that people will know who we were and who we are. And that our children, our kids, will be proud of their ancestors. So I have to confess that I didn't know very much at the time about bison hunting. Neither archaeology nor ethnography. But I figured that I needed to learn from the Blackfeet first so that I understood what they thought about bison and bison hunting in their own past. And then I could design a project to their own liking. So my friend, the philosopher, John, began to teach me about Blackfoot metaphysics. And of course, Blackfoot metaphysics is a complete, well-developed, fully cognizant, fully explicit way of looking at the world. It is not a primitive religion. It is not a belief system. It is not a symbolic system. It is not a superstition. It is not totemism. It is not animism. It is philosophy of science, a la Blackfoot, right? And the most important thing about this philosophy of science, of Blackfoot science, is that it is encoded in the language. The language structure carries in its own all the philosophical principles that govern their lives and their worlds, their visible and the invisible worlds. And therefore, every time that you speak Blackfoot, you are actually reminding yourself of the philosophical principles that rule the universe in your own life, in your own society, in your own culture. So I understood also from John, and what I knew about Western philosophy of science, that what we think about science and what non-Western non uh, people specifically Native Americans, and particularly the Blackfoot, actually think about science and how the world works, and how the, what principles do they use to explain the world. And it was in a stark contrast to our way of thinking. For example, in the Blackfoot world, everything has a soul, human and non-human. Everything is animated by, by a powerful life source that connects all the beings in the world, with all the forces in the universe, with all the deities in the sky, they are all connected. And because they are all connected, they are free to move about the universe. They are free to travel. Imagine if these life source, these connected, uh, connecting life source were like a huge system of rivers, of navigable rivers. Well, things and beings and forces can actually navigate the universe through that system. And when we think about our categories of being, our categories of being are very, very strict. And uh, for example, we have plants, animals, and minerals, right? And a plant cannot may be an animal, and an animal cannot be a mineral, or vice versa. Well, in the Blackfoot world, not so. You might encounter a very large rock, one of those erratic boulders that are leftovers from the Ice Age, and you don't know whether it is indeed a rock or it's perhaps a bison or maybe a grizzly bear. So you're cautious about this rock and just for good measure, you place an offering on the rock, on the spirit of the rock, tobacco, a dollar bill, right? And then, of course, because the world is fluid and you do not know when things are going to be in a certain stage, in a certain mode, in a certain appearance or materiality, the world is very uncertain. Humans inhabit a, very, a world that is very narrow in terms of ideal conditions for survival. And it is dangerous, inherently dangerous. It is uncertain. It, so everything that humans do and everything that humans learn, and they learn it through the spirits and through, and through other humans and through non-human persons, goes into acquiring power to make the world 
less dangerous, less uncertain, and more predictable. To have an upper hand into the world, a world that is, frankly, a lot larger than humanity itself. So power and power acquisition through vision quests, through dreams, and through very formal channels of information transfer from person to person and through generations actually allows humans, the black food, to survive and be prosperous and live well. And that is what they pursue, and therefore their system overall developed into a very formal system of learning and knowledge sharing. And then, of course, knowledge in the chaotic and uncertain world actually requires order. And the Blackfoot used the concept of bundle to bring order into that chaotic diversity of the world. So bundling is both a concept and, and, and it has in a material thing. Bundling is a way to order the universe, to discern what things can work together as a team, and what things cannot work together as a team. And these teams are spirits, objects, people, deities. And each of these bundles, each of these teams, when they work together, they are larger than the sum of parts. So, so they also have a material representation that is called the bundle, the sacred bundle, the ceremonial bundle, which the Blackfeet at some point acquired and probably four or 5,000 years ago and then carried them on to this day. Bundles, needless to say, are essential to the bison hunt. So how does the universe and the bundle universe look from bison's perspective? Bison has its own bundle. And in this bundle, he has allies and enemies. Beaver is one of his best friends because beaver collects and protects water bodies on the surface of the prairie. So when bison migrate, they have water to drink in between permanent streams. Fire is one, is one of bison's closest allies, because fire renews the prairie, and bison naturally flocked to freshly burned grass. Then he has enemies, he has predators. Wolf and grizzly bear are the only predators who can really fell a bison. And then there's hunters. Where, what's the place of hunters in the bison universe? Well, hunters are equal or less than bison. Alone and naked in the world, it would be very difficult to them to fell a bison and successfully eat it, right? Process it and eat it. But humans have helpers. One of their main allies and helper, the most intimate helper, is a marine fossil called ammonite. You probably have seen ammonites in the Rock and Mineral Show. Ammonites are these marine fossils that can be broken into a certain way. And sometimes when you break them, the fragments look like a little bison. In Blackfoot, they are called iniskin. Now, the fossils at some point in the past, in the deep, deep past, gave hunters a magical song. It's called the bison call, the bison calling ceremony. And when they sing this song and do the ceremony, they can actually charm bison so that bison can willingly come to them and they can guide them onto their death. And if you think about how many pieces of knowledge and objects um, humans require to, to successfully hunt a herd of bison, it is just staggering. They receive, from the, from the deities, they receive weapons. From the animals, they receive bundles, and also the knowledge on how to hunt, for example, with wolf, how to hunt in a pack, how to drive bison in a pack. Of course, they have their charming song. From thunder, they got fire and rain-making magic. And from the water beings, the two ceremonial tipis called the black and yellow buffalo lodges. But hunting is not extractive in the Blackfoot world. It's not just that you charm the bison and you, and you, and you successfully kill it and process it and, and, and so forth. This is a partnership. It is a contract between bison and humans. 
And in this contract, the rules of the hunting bundle, the bison bundle, have to be observed. People have to respect the bison cycles, they have to manage the grassland in, a, in an appropriate manner, and they have to conduct renewal ceremonies so that every time they kill an animal, their spirit will remain alive. And in fact, hunters drink bison's blood as soon as they kill bison so that that act of uh, a transfer of life will retain the spirit of the dead, the dead bison alive, and that will be able to come back on earth and be hunted again. So, armed with this rudimentary amount of knowledge about Blackfoot philosophy, which is infinitely more profound than what I can ever explain or even understand, um, and with some background knowledge in archaeology, uh, we designed, my, a group of uh, graduate students, now alumni, and I designed the Bison Hunting Landscape Project. It was a, a five-year project, and of course, the Blackfeet Tribe of Montana and uh, the Historic Preservation Office were our partners and hosts, and we received about four or five grants, large and small, to support five years of, of research. Uh, the Bureau of Applied Research in Anthropology was the, the, the uh, manager of all of our projects. And then we had um, several generations of graduate students from the U of A. And also we train, to this day, we continuously train um, Blackfoot tribal members as para-archaeologists for job placement. And, that's, and that uh, school is, is really successful. And then, of course, we had external collaborators, uh, two of our alumni and uh, uh, my dear colleagues uh, from Southern Methodist University. And then, of course, last but not least, David Yenman uh, produced a fantastic program on uh, Blackfeet and Bison for Indian Americans. All right, so my previous colleagues had focused intensely on the bison kill sites. In these bison kill sites, that one of which you saw in that picture of uh, George Friesen, they are nothing but layer upon layer upon layer of bone, animal, I mean, bison bone, sometimes predators, predators' bones, and the appropriate tools for ki killing, butchering, and processing the animals. My colleagues, because of the depth of these sites and the difficulty in excavating them, they tended to excavate so deep into the ground that they lost sight of the horizon. In our project, we wanted to do exactly the opposite. We wanted to, yes, use those uh, bone beds as uh, a departing point, but also we wanted to get a bird's eye view that would be commensurate with the immensity and the scale of bringing herds of bison onto their death across the prairie and across the ridges. And we had some questions that we wanted to revisit from previous, uh, previous research, but we also wanted to ask new questions. For example, the Blackfoot have this uh, oral tradition about using fire to clear the grassland from nuisance plants so that the bison would come. We turned that oral tradition into a research question and implemented that research question on the ground. And then, of course, we wanted to learn more about the social organization that supported such a huge enterprise as the communal hunt. The Blackfoot Aboriginal territory is enormous. It covers the better part of Alberta and Saskatchewan and almost all of Montana. It straddles the Rocky Mountain front and extends onto the prairie. And as you can see in this map, every little white dot is a is either a prehistoric campsite or a kill site. It is literally covered with archaeology. Also, as it so happens, this territory corresponds to the fescue province of the North American grasslands. And, and fescue grasses are highly nutritious grasses that are bison's favorite food. They are also very fire happy. So when fire alights and renews the, uh, the fescue grassland, Bison just flock naturally into, into the area. And when you see the territory in cross-section, 
What you see is a, is a variety of elevational zones. And every elevational zone was used by the Blackfoot, by the, in, the, in the ancestral bison hunters, for different logistical purposes, depending on the season and the activity. It was on the foothills, however, that the large winter hunts took place. That's where bison came to winter, in the sheltered valleys of the foothills. That's where people winter, and that's where they hunted in larger scale. In addition to being the place of, of, uh, wind for wintering for the bison, the foothills have a very unique topography. The, the valleys are entrenched and they have uh, high ridges. And those high ridges also have often uh, some very steep uh, deadfalls, the very steep precipices. And so the hunters were able to utilize those precipices to drive a herd of bison and push the bison into a stampede down, on the, uh, down the precipice and they would fall onto the ground and they would either die immediately and they would be finished up and butchered right at the bottom of the cliff. And for our study, we chose an entire river valley in the center south portion of the, of the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. And we chose this valley for a variety of reasons. First, it had some really significant oral traditions that were closely associated with some archaeological sites. And second, the topography of the valley was ideal for bison hunting through this method called the jump, pushing the herd over the cliff. And then, of course, um, this valley also had a number of very well-known sites that were spectacular bison jumps, bison hunting sites. So we decided this is the ideal place to start, and we are going to do uh, as much as we could a valley-wide survey and reconnaissance. Here we are, uh, uh, we are at um, one of the bison jumps, uh, the Katoyes bison jump. There are two of our alumni, Jesse Ballinger and uh, Bill Wrightsey, setting up the total station so that we can do a little mapping. Um, we decided that we will begin from the known to the unknown. And once you locate a jump, this one in particular had a very deep bone bed. Once you locate a jump, you just climb over the cliff onto the top of the ridge, and then you begin looking for any kind of hunting structure that would have helped the hunters contain the bison and bring them onto their death. Now, these structures are called the bison drive. The bison drive is a funnel-shaped structure made of two, made of two linear, linear features of stone, the wider part is on the back side of the ridge. The narrowest part is right above the deadfall. And at the bottom of the deadfall, there is a corral. Now, this was a sacred template for the, for the Blackfoot, but it's also a very efficient way of trapping and hunting and pushing a large number of animals, especially trapping a large number of animals. And if you come next week to Alison Deming's uh, talk about herring, you will see that uh, herring fishers, fishermen, also build these kind of funnel-shaped structures to trap and harvest large numbers of fish. Now, of course, the template is elegant in theory, but once you lay it on the ground and in the actual topography, it is very complex because you have to uh, you have to accommodate the template to every swale on the ground, every rise on the ground, if there are some little streams or what we call in the southwest bajadas or washes. Uh, they, they are called up north coolies. And then once you set it them in a way that it seems to work, you bring in the herd and you keep the herd within these linear features made of stone, and then you stampede them over the, over the cliff. These features are made of thousands, literally thousands. And I, say, and I know that there were several thousand because I myself recorded them with my students and my colleagues. It's thousands of little rock piles, no larger than a large basket. And these rock piles are evenly spaced from the deadfall all the way to the, ba to the, to the backside to where the, the bison gather and milled around. They can go one mile, three miles, maybe more. But these rock piles 
just definitely follow the topography and follow the template. And when people didn't have enough rock, they would use bison dung, dry bison dung to pile it up to make these little structures. And on top of, the, of, these, of these rock piles, they would put some brush. So they, there was the illusion of a fence but the, black, the, but the bison didn't figure out that that was like a, like a flimsy fence. They just saw the fence and followed it through. I have to tell you how to survey these. You do it on foot. Not on horse, not on car, not with satellite imagery. You walk it. Every single rock pile. You walk it and you GPS it. And there is a reason why our project was was um, very new in the Northwestern Plains and among our Plains colleagues, it was because until the arrival of the GPS technology, people couldn't actually map every single one of these, these structures, and therefore maps of these drivelands may be covered 100 meters, 200 meters, and then they stopped. Well, I have personally walked miles and miles across a highway into a private carport, through their backyard, through their corral, across the hay field, pick up the line again at the end of, the, of, of, of 10 miles of line. And I couldn't love it more. <laughs> oh, sorry, but I have to, shout, to give a shout out to my, uh, my long time uh, Blackfeet archeologist, uh, Del Fenner Sr. He started working with us in 2007 and continues to work with us and he's the most superfluous archeology span that I have ever known. So, at the end of five years, we found this incredible amount of features, over 36,000 individual rock features. Not all of them, although the majority were hunting features, not all of them were. People were not only hunting in the valley, they were living in the valley, they were doing ceremonies in the valley, they were building memorial monuments to their death in the valley, and they were also building vision quest sites so that they could actually acquire more knowledge and more power. Just to give you a sense of how, this, the, how the, the sites looked in the space, because this is a satellite photo, you cannot really, you cannot not really accurately portray these, these driveline features, these big hunting facilities. They are not very photogenic at all. But if you see this map, uh, you have illustrates three clusters of hunting of, of hunting uh, features of drive lines. And they, here they looked like little spider legs, but in reality, they cover anywhere between six and 20 square kilometers each. And the beauty and the, and the ingenuity of the hunters was that to position the, uh, the, drive, the drive lines, the bison drives, across, from the, across the river from one another. So that if bison, for any reason, turn around and cross the river, there were the other hunters out there ready to use the opposite uh, drive line to actually take advantage of the, of the moving herd. So they were ready, uh, they were very tactical and they were on their feet, ready to make any changes depending on changes of the wind, changes of the weather, the, the sun exposure. They truly were observants of nature and, and meteorology and ecology. And they were, they were genial at it. These sites were incredibly efficient and successful. And you can see that these pairs were um, <clears throat> spaced out also more or less evenly along the, along the valley, about 10 miles from one another. And uh, each one was unique and uniquely located, but there was one single common feature of all of these jumps and all of these uh, hunting sites, and that is that when the bison are rushing toward the deadfall, the lead cow, the one in front, cannot see the deadfall. Bison can see across the river, but they cannot see right in front of them. We simulated that over and over and over again, and it always came out significant in terms of the single most important condition for success, whether bison would not be able to see where they were going and where they wanna fall. And these guys were just like amazing. They were like diabolical, at it. really diabolical. And I think I should be citing uh, J.P. Lewis for, for having said diabolical for the first time in the 1940s. All right, so there was a second part of our project that had never done, been done before, certainly not in the Northwestern Plains.
and not in these sites. As you recall, I had told you that <clears throat> we were uh, looking into ways of testing uh, the use of fire, anthropogenic fire, to see if these prehistoric hunters were going to use anthropogenic, were using anthropogenic fire in the valleys. So my brilliant colleague and also a U of A alumni, Chris, uh, Christopher Rose from Southern Methodist University, and his wife and colleague, uh, Casey Hollenbach, um, came to help us design uh, a study, uh, a test for finding uh, evidence of grassland fire. And in bison hunting territory, there's basically two signs of fire that everybody knows. One is the fire that you use to clean the killing area, the butchering area, so that vermin will not stay and the smell will go away. That fire, it burns so hot that it turns the, the, the ground into brick. The other, of course, fire signal is the random wildlife, uh, I mean, wildlife fire, right? The wildfire. You never know when, when thunder's gonna strike, when lightning's gonna strike, and you don't know where to find it until you see it burning. Well, in these sites, what, what Chris and Casey did is they cleaned up sections of the riverbank to see if there was any buried deposit that contained burned grass. And lo and behold, if you look at the upper right photograph, you are gonna see thin layers of black soil, chock full of charcoal. And it is, of course, Above the charcoal, there is more alluvial, and then there's another layer of charcoal, then there's another layer of charcoal, there, then there's another layer of charcoal. We dated those layers of charcoal, of burned grass, and they date precisely to the, uh, uh, precisely to the time when the drive lines were built and the, and the kill sites were used, the jumps were used. Burning began at the time of construction and ended when the sites were decommissioned and people moved north for a time. So we knew that this was a sequential burning pattern, of burning of the grassland, and it had a non-random pattern. Humans tend to be non-random. This was a non-random pattern. But more importantly, it was not just non-random, it was asynchronous, and by that I mean that we, of all of the samples we took along the river, none of them burned at the same time. The hunters were burning one section of the valley first, then they were moving to another section, and they were moving to another section. So while one was recovering from burning, the other one was growing fresh grass, and the other one was about to be burned. So, in short, we actually were able to illustrate not only the degree and the intensity with which the landscape was actually utilized and bison was utilized, but also the depth and the extent of permanent modification of the ecology of the grassland and of the topography of the river. These guys were landscape engineers and landscape ecologists, and that is one of the greatest and most satisfactory discoveries that I think our project actually came to. So when you look at bison hunting, in short, you have to look at it at multiple scales. You, ha you have to look at it at the place where the bison fell to their death, at the place where they were grazing, at the scale where they were being driven into the valley. Similarly, you have to look at it from uh, at various temporal scales. The millenary knowledge that people accumulated from, from vision quests and from personal experience and from transmission of knowledge through the millennia came to bear on centennial scale transformation and modification of the landscape for hunting. Three, six, 700 years, 800 years of occupation of the valley. And then, of course, both millenary knowledge and centenary transformation and modification of the valley came to bear on every hunting episode. So all of those scales need to be considered at once. And then two very important organizational principles from the perspective of society and how hunters organize themselves to be able to be prosperous and succeed. 
the yin and the yang of communal hunting, cooperation and order. We often hear the hunters cooperate with one another and they are very altruistic. Well, when you're hunting several hundred bison every single season and you have a lot of mouths to feed, you cannot just cooperate. You also have to impart order. But cooperation can be seen, you know, at the site level with the construction of these huge facilities that require, you know, the transportation of thousands of rock. You can see it at the valley in terms of how the sites were laid out and how organic communication must have been in order to successfully move herds from one hunting cluster to another. And then, of course, at the regional level, cooperating brings the ability to buffer times of scarcity, to protect yourself from scarcity by communicating properly and cooperating with your fellow hunters down the river or across, ac ac across another valley. And that also protects you from danger and from intruders. And then order. The very communal hunt is in and of itself our organizing principle, our ordering principle, because it structures opportunity for future success. When you permanently change the landscape, you create, a, you create a human, a cultural landscape that you can control, that, you can, that allows you to predict to an extent, right? And then it prediction also promotes permanence among mobile hunters that do not occupy the valley year round. There were several different kinds of leaders. The leader of the hunt, the civilian leader, the war chief, and the, and the religious leaders. And the religious leaders generally held the highest of powers along with the war chiefs. And then there were these supraband corporations. They're corporate institutions better known as sodalities or bundle groups or, or uh, mystical societies. And the function of these societies was to cross-cut uh, band identity and cross-cut gender and age so that um, pools of knowledge would be maintained within the institution, within the society, and they would be properly transferred to the initiated and to other younger generations. And, of course, these corporations also helped, not necessarily forcefully, but by their very functioning, to redistribute wealth. Because by, you know, by the time when, when uh, bison, communal bison hunting was at its height, these people were really, really rich. They were very wealthy. Now, in terms of the evolution of the hunt, and just to sum all this up, if you look at the past 5,000 years, what you see is, is at the beginning you have, you, you, you have small groups of people already positioning themselves strategically on the landscape in places where, where bison would be most likely to be, to, be, to be there, to be present or to be hunted. But as archaeologists often need proxies of measurement of growth and evolution, because we cannot measure everything and we can certainly do not, cannot count people very accurately. So in this particular case, a good proxy of evolution from stalking single animals to, to the, the height of the communal hunt is the acreage of hunting space as defined by the archaeological hunting ground. So the first of the first uh, two or three millennia in this graph, what you have is relatively small sites. They grow in pace with the natural growth of population and the natural colonization of new niches, new grasslands. And um, <clears throat> of course, communal hunting rises uh, about 4,000 years ago, as we said. But it is a two, the 2,000-year the mark that you can really see the, the uh, impact of technological innovations on the rise of the communal hunt. And first, first is fire. With fire, you can not only you can not only manipulate the, the migration patterns of the bison herd, but you can also renew the grassland. And that has the effect of increasing the human carrying capacity of the prairie, of the, of the region. So you can have more people coming in and more people hunting and sites begin to get much larger. Then of course, 
once you have the ability to bring in large numbers of bison, you begin to develop the bison, the bison driving technology in the form of the constructions of these, of these permanent facilities, these stone facilities, and with a lot of animals being killed and processed, you have to devise a way to store food that you are not consuming immediately. And pemmican, I don't know, you probably have heard the word pemmican. Pemmican is a highly nutritious cake, like a health bar, made of dried, crushed bison meat with berries and bison fat. And you make them into these very lightweight, um, very long, li long shelf life, very you know, easily storable cakes. And you can transport them, and if you prepare them properly, they will last up to two years. So with the, with the manufacture of pemmican also comes the ability to trade for other products, such as corn or feathers or you know, tubers, etc. And shortly thereafter, the bow and arrow comes in. The bow, the bow and arrow gives the hunters the ability to shoot bison at a very short distance and repeatedly shoot them within a short period of time. Once those technologi technological innovations are in place, you can see how the size of the hunting space just explodes. It goes up to 1,000 fold in terms of acreage of hunting space. And this system goes all the way to the arrival of Europeans. It, ha it peaks during the first 50 to 80 years of European arrival because the Europeans that came into the northwestern plains were hungry and not very able to feed themselves English fur traders. And immediately the Native Americans figured out that they could get guns and they could get, you know, like luxuries and many other, many other European goods in exchange for feeding the Europeans. And they fed them pemmican in addition to fresh meat. So they had for, for the first, I said, 50 to 80 years, maybe even 100 years, the upper hand in regulating the comings and goings of Europeans and Europeans' fortunes. And that is one of the things that I believe only recently my colleague George Colpitz had uh, made explicit in his book, uh, Pemmican Empire. So I started with the story of loss. When the system, the height of the, in the peak of the communal hunt, tanks in 1850 and on with the arrival of Industrial Revolution and the federal, the U.S. government, federal uh, mandated extinction of bison and confinement in reservations. But I didn't want to leave you with a sense of loss. I want to give you, give you a sense of hope. I want to give you an idea of how hopeful is the future of hunters and bison in North America. And bison has recovered, but the road took 100 years to recover. It was only because a few dedicated ranchers and, and park rangers and uh, private, concerned private citizens and their efforts and their lobbying that viable herds began to emerge out of a few pairs of reproducing animals. It took a hundred years to create reserves both in Canada and the U.S. that would actually invest in reproductive systems programs for bison. And they were incredibly successful. They were so successful, in fact, that 100 years after the last bison hunt, Congress funded the Bison <clears throat> Intertribal Council to begin to establish bison ranchers inside Indian reservations. For their part, the Native Americans, the Blackfoot in particular, and the Blackfeet tribe in particular, um, they suffer incredible, incredible losses, staggering losses. They was like the rock had been pulled from under their feet, and they walked around in the beginning, people say, as if lost in a fog. They suffer a large massacre upon which they very uh, humbly walked into the reservation on their own will. And after the last bison hunt, they were so lost because they didn't know what else to eat that they almost starved to death because ra government rations weren't enough to, to feed so many people. And then within a generation of two, they began to, they didn't want to abandon hunting. So they began to reinvent and reorient the hunt toward elk and toward the Rocky Mountain front where they could actually freely hunt 
outside the purview of the federal government and the missionaries who wanted to, of course, uh, civilize them. During the late portion, the, the late portion of the 20th century, there were a lot of movements such as the American Indian Movement, a lot of uh, youth after the Vietnam War uh, came back to the reservations. They had been relocated, their parents had been relocated, they wanted to come back and relearn who they were and find their culture. It was a quest for cultural identity. And they, of course, saw the elders that were, that were still alive and had knowledge about their past to teach them again the rules of the game and the rules of the bundles so that they could actually revitalize their culture. And a variety, like a number of uh, pieces of federal legislation, allowed them to actually do that and protect them while they were questing for their culture, for their own identity. And um, with the repatriation, with legislation for, they are allowed for the repatriation of human remains and uh, sacred items, the Blackfoot were able to recover bundles that had been sold or had been lost or that had been confiscated from them in Canada and the US. And with those hunting bundles, the beaver bundle, they began to uh, develop an initiative for bison's return. Bison are, are thriving and growing, look at them. They are enjoying the comforts of modernity, right? <laughs> They're smart. Bison is growing, tribal herds are growing. Um, Co-management is incredibly needed and uh, there's a lot of cooperation between private states federal and tribal ranch, uh, ranches to actually keep healthy herds and to keep them growing, but keep them also under control because bison used to roam freely, but they can't do that anymore. They live in a closed system that requires grassland management, that requires uh, population management through a strategic culling of the herds and, uh, and uh, for example, hunting and slaughtering. And slaughtering for like healthy food. So with bison's return, hunting return, and in 2018, Yellowstone National Park opened the hunting season for bison for the Western tribes that were culturally affiliated to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem that, were, that signed the Laramie Treaty of 1851, and the Blackfoot were one of them. So the Blackfoot Canadian and, and, and American hunters, 80 of them, along with their bundles, along with their magical songs and their magical fossils, their Inishkim, trek down to Yellowstone, 600 miles away, said their prayers, performed their ceremonies, sang their songs, and I believe they harvested about 2,000 bison. And the way in which they explained it to me, when they saw their peers on foot driving the bison, from the park onto the hunting ground, onto the shooting ground, the, their hair in the back of their neck stood on edge. It was like going back 130 years. It was amazing. It was awesome, according to the, to the eyewitnesses. And I personally want to go and experience it myself. But with the hunt also comes the necessity for the renewal of the partnership. 130 years later, you can't just go and hunt bison and come home and put it in a freezer. You make sausage out of them. What you need to do, really, and what the tribe is doing and what the Blackfoot Confederacy as a whole is doing, is finding the means to actually begin to renew the old partnerships with the cosmos. And among them, of course, central to them, the partnership with bison. In the summer of 2018, my students and I were honored and humbled to be invited to a historical event that had not happened in 130 years. Um, it was the transfer of the Horn Society, Society bundles from the Blackfoot in Canada to the Blackfeet in the United States. The Horn Society is a mystical society that it has the power to enter the deepest folds of knowledge of the universe, and particularly the deepest folds of bison's bundled universe. And this society was brought back to the American Blackfeet. And the ceremony, the seven-day ceremony, 
was larger than life. We were overwhelmed, we were silent, we were awed. But more than anything else, after we discussed it among ourselves, we walked away with a sense that there was such immense amount of hope in that ceremony for healing historical trauma, for educating the youth, and for giving them hope for a better future. Thank you. Wow, that was marvelous. Uh, I hope to see you next Thursday where Allison Hawthorne Deming will be talking about herring and um, the, um, the fantastic story of herring in the maritime provinces. And please, if you're around this weekend, uh, we don't expect any rain, please uh, join us at Tucson Meet Yourself right here downtown. Thank you all for your attendance. Bye-bye.